I will discuss um, figures, uh, random figures such as uh, this one. Uh, this um, is called uh, DLA. We will get to it uh, later. Uh, it's rather poorly understood, um, but other random uh, planar systems um, very much like it, which were um, rather mysterious until uh, recently, have, uh, have uh, now been uh, have seen uh, a lot of progress uh, in terms of our understanding, and we will. Um, that's what I want to tell you about. Okay, so uh, my title uh, is Conformally Invariant Random Processes, but it could equally be called uh, How Carlson Has the Best Insight. Um, here's the plan. We will. Um, focus on percolation as the primary uh, model to discuss because its definition is uh, very natural from a mathematical point of view. Um, and we will um, start with uh, discussing overview of percolation. What is percolation and uh, what are kind of the typical questions in the field? And then focus more uh, narrowly on the case where the percolation is planar and critical. I will say what this means. And move on to describe recent progress. Uh, then we will, uh, as time permits, uh, discuss other processes where the answers are uh, rather similar, though the models are um, defined uh, quite differently. And for some of the so there are certainly many models where uh, the answers are, are really uh, still uh, waiting to be discovered. Okay, um, so we start with the definition. Uh, here's what bond percolation is. You take some infinite graph G and you pick some parameter P between 0 and 1. And if you're doing what's called Bernoulli P bond percolation, uh, then you take every edge in the graph and you flip a p-biased coin to decide if you keep the edge or you throw it away um, independently. So each edge is selected with probability p. And then you have a random graph, um, the percolation graph. And you study the properties of this graph, specifically um, connected components and connection properties. And this is what uh, percolation is about. This is one type of uh, percolation model. Um, another type is similar, but instead of choosing each edge with probability p, you choose each uh, site, which is another word for vertex in uh, percolation jargon, um, with probability p. And then you similarly have a, a random graph where you delete the edges and the vertices that are not selected, and you study uh, the properties of the graph. Um, and there are other various uh, natural models um, you can think of. If you want a model which is rotationally invariant, for example, you can sprinkle a set of uh, Poisson points in the plane. You can think of this just as um, you're sprinkling uniformly um, a set of many points in the plane with some, some density. And for each, around each point, you draw a disk with, uh, with a given radius. So the radius could be a parameter. The density of the point could be a parameter. I'm saying disk, but this actually generalizes in any, it's valid in other dimensions and other metric spaces. So maybe I should, at this point, still be talking about the balls uh, rather than disks. Um, and then you think of the union of all these balls, uh, this black set, and you study connection properties of, of that, this random black set. It is in flavor similar to the graph uh, definition of percolation, but has certain advantages of di and disadvantages. The primary advantage here is that you have rotational invariance. Um, 
the role of the parameter p that we had in percolation can be played here in the, uh, by the radius. As you vary p um, in the discrete model, um, you increase the number of things that are connected. And here, if you increase the radii, um, the, uh, col collection, the black set becomes uh, more and more connected. Um, and why do we study percolation? Well, uh, here's one answer. Um, it's um, a good model for a phase transition. And let me tell you what this means. Uh, it's easy to see that there is some particular number, PC, um, between 0 and 1 in, in the space of parameters. Um, so that if your P is above that PC, you have an infinite component in the system. Um, if we're in the graph, say, then there is an infinite subgraph in the percolation graph. Um, um, so if you're above PC, this happens with probability 1. You're going to have an infinite component. And if you're below PC, it doesn't happen, or, or we should say happens with probability 0. Um, this doesn't address the, the question of what happens at PC, which is uh, an interesting question we'll get back to. And what does this have to do with phase transition? It turns out that the large-scale behavior of the system changes drastically uh, as you increase P um, beyond PC. Uh, if P is slightly smaller than PC, uh, smaller but fixed, we fix uh, um, some value of P smaller than PC and look at things very far away, they're very, very unlikely to be connected. If, if P is above PC and we look at things far away, they're pretty likely to be connected. And um, this uh, fast change in the behavior of the system is um, sort of like uh, the process where when you change the temperature, uh, ice melts into water. And um, therefore, it's a, it's a baby model for phase transition. Now, this, this parameter PC, it depends on the particular percolation model that you choose. Um, for example, it, it was in, the, in the previous uh, case where you discuss this, uh, this is called, has several names. This can, one name is the Boolean model. In the Boolean model, the radius, is, there's going to be a critical radius, not a, a critical probability. Um, And here are some sample uh, questions that you ask um, in the setting of percolation. Um, you can ask, if you have a general graph, you can, you can ask um, what does, you know, you, you have your favorite graph. Maybe it's a Cayley graph. Maybe it's a, a big random graph. Um, maybe it's uh, the internet. You can ask, well, what is the PC of that graph? Uh, is it one? Um, you can ask about uh, questions that are not at PC. Most interesting questions that don't involve uh, behavior at PC look at the behavior as P approaches PC, because that is um, near PC is where all the interesting stuff happens. Um, A fundamental question that still hasn't been answered is in, in our uh, most familiar graph, ZD, most familiar infinite graph, um, is there an infinite cluster when P equals to PC? Well, we know there is one uh, when P is larger than PC. We know there is none when P is below PC. What happens at PC? Um, there are some answers here. Um, Harris and Keston approved two theorems we will mention shortly. Combined, they say, when d equals 2, in dimension 2, there is no percolation at PC. And um, 
how I enslaved in, in um, quite complicated and, and beautiful work based on the lace expansion answer uh, this question for sufficiently high dimensions. They show when D is at least 19, uh, there is no infinite cluster at PC. And, um, and in some of the range, well, between dimension 6 and 19, in theory, the method of how I enslaved should, could be made to work. Um, but uh, it's believed that in dimensions between 3 and 6, uh, the picture is completely different and the method definitely uh, doesn't work. So, um, so there, there's a range in, of these where you can say, well, we basically know the picture and uh, we haven't been able to nail the details and there's a range of these where we really don't know um, what, what it looks like. Um, but um, my main interest has been, and, and the subject of this talk will be more in two dimensions. It turns out that two dimensions are rather special because of the connections to complex analysis. And uh, complex analysis will play a, an important role in um, understanding of percolation and other random systems in the plane. And um, from now on, we will uh, specialize to the case of critical percolation in planar lattices. Uh, for example, uh, the case of bond percolation uh, in Z squared. So here are the theorems of Harris and Kesson about uh, planar, about z squared and some other planar lattices. Harris proved that when p is, is a half, there is no infinite cluster. And therefore, you know that pc is at least one half. And Kesson in uh, 1980, uh, 20 years later, proved that PC is one half. Namely, he showed that if P is larger than one half, uh, then there are infinite clusters almost surely uh, with probability one. And if you put these two together, well, um, you get this. Well, I guess you get the statement of the second one. PC is one half. Um, let me tell you why you would you should think that this is kind of obvious. Um, it, these two theorems, um, it's hard to appreciate them until you try to prove them yourself. Um, it's, it's very easy to see why they should be true, and this is the picture. If you look uh, in z squared, there's a kind of duality uh, which works as follows. You, you look at an n plus 1 by n rectangle, which is maybe the, red, the, the rectangle uh, of, of red edges here, and you do uh, percolation on that rectangle. And for each edge that you have thrown out, you put the perpendicular dual uh, blue edge. And then you have what the blue uh, edges form a dual percolation in, in the blue rectangle, which is n by n plus 1. And it's easy to see topologically that you have a crossing in the red between the left side and the right side, if and only if you don't have a crossing in the blue. And the distribution of the blue rectangle, uh, I mean the blue percolation, is the same as the distribution of the red percolation, except for rotation. And therefore, these two events are complementary, um, and they have the same probability. Therefore, they have probability a half. And so we conclude that for an n plus 1 by n rectangle, the probability to cross it is exactly 1 half. Um, and, um, 
you know, this suggests that um, when, when you, you are at one half, you're about balanced between being able to connect and failing to connect. You're, uh, the two forces are uh, at equal power, and that's why uh, PC should be one half. And um, the proof that PC, that Harris's theorem, namely that at one half you don't have a crossing, is, is not too hard. Um, Keston's theorem uh, by now is also not too hard. I mean, with an extra 10 minutes, I could prove it to you. But it does use some, a few clever tricks, which uh, would exhaust you too much, and, and therefore I wouldn't be able to uh, tell you some other stuff. Um, so, um, so here, the, you know, the issue of connecting uh, to having a domain and connecting two parts of the boundary turns out to be fundamental in uh, in Keston's theorem and Harris's theorem. And um, here's a, a very basic tool that was used by Keston and is very important. And that talks about the probability to connect left and right in a rectangle, which is not necessarily n plus 1 by n. Uh, once you realize that to connect n plus 1 by n, it takes uh, the probability is a half at p equals a half, you want to ask, OK, well, what happens if I have a slightly different uh, rectangle? And the russo simon welsh theorem uh, gives us a partial answer to to this question. It says, suppose we have a rectangle whose width is rho times L and whose height is L, where rho is some parameter. And we look at the probability to have a left-right crossing in this rectangle. What is that probability going to tend to as, as the scale becomes larger, as L grows? Well. We don't know the limit yet. At least Russo, Simo, and Welsh didn't know. Um, but they could show, I mean, it's Russo, Simo, uh, no, Simo, Welsh, and Russo, two independent uh, teams proved it about the same time. They could show that uh, the limit is not, is, uh, the limit inf is not zero. So no matter what is the shape of the rectangle, um, if you fix the aspect ratio, as the scale grows, the probability to connect doesn't go to zero. Let me tell you, um, before I go to uh, more recent work which uh, improves on, on this result, let me tell you um, more about some questions one can look at and some conjectures coming from physics regarding the answers to these questions. Um, so we know that at PC there is no uh, infinite cluster. But suppose that we uh, insist on the cluster of the origin being quite large. Um, what does it mean, insist? Well, we, you know, we, we uh, throw our coins. And if we've succeeded, fine. And if not, we repeat. Uh, we start all over again and, and, and sample a new sample until we get um, a sample where the, the, the cluster of the origin has more than a thousand vertices, say. Then this is what it looks like. Now, um, you may think that I didn't center this, uh, this figure correctly, but um, I didn't want to center it according to the bounding box. I wanted the origin to be in the center. Uh, the origin is in the center of the figure, but uh, you know the cluster is, you know, doesn't. It, it isn't centered. It's a random thing, and and it it has uh, these. Uh, it looks like this. I could call it strange if 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 I wanted to. Uh, and. Um, you can you can ask about the properties of this of this cluster. What uh, well, what is it? What, what's its diameter going to be? Um, what is the outer boundary size? Um, 
How often does it happen that I find a cluster with a thousand vertices? And there are some answers to these questions. Um, there are predictions from physics. Uh, Nienhuis uh, made the conjecture that the probability that the origin is in a cluster of diameter r, so cluster means connected component of the percolation uh, graph. Um, the, prob the probability the cluster has diameter at least r behaves like r to the minus 5 over 48 and lower order corrections. And um, Cardi uh, conjectured that the probability that the same probability except that you restrict yourself to a half plane decays like r to the minus one third. And these, these exponents um, minus 5 over 48, minus 1 third, they uh, often come from uh, tables in, in uh, character uh, representations, in, in uh, character tables of, uh, of the Virasoro algebra. Uh, don't ask me to explain to you what this means. Um, but um, in, in physics, the point of view, they, they understood that conformal invariance is, uh, or rather conformal covariance is important to understanding uh, these models. And they made all kinds of assumptions that there are some um, random, uh, mostly smooth fields that, that have um, conformal covariance properties. And, based on, on some heuristic assumptions and some uh, pretty good guesswork, they came up with um, these exponents. Cardi, this exponent by Cardi is actually a particular um, consequence of a much more precise formula he, he proposed. Um, in connection with the uh, russo siemer welsh theorem. Suppose that you're not happy with russo siemer welsh Suppose you, know, you want to know exactly what the limit is. Remember, russo siemer welsh just said that the limit inf is bigger than zero. Now, um, if you're a physicist, you, 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 you don't care about this nonsense. You want to know what the limit is. And, um, and here was, here's what the limit is. It's this, uh, it's this expression here. So here you have the gamma function. You have, well, eta, I will explain what eta is shortly. And this is the hypogeometric function. Um, so here's Cardi's formula. This is the asymptotic probability that you connect left to right in this rectangle as the uh, as the mesh of the system goes to zero or as the scale of this rectangle goes to infinity. And what is eta? Eta is going to be the cross ratio. If you map the rectangle conformally into the upper half plane, eta is the cross ratio of the four corners. Well, very natural from the conformal uh, point of view. Um, but uh, Leonard Carlson came up with a much better formula, um, which I can remember. See, Cardi's formula I will never be able to remember. But Carlson's ver version, uh, I mean, this right-hand side here, which is, uh, I don't see my pointer. Oh, here it is. See this right-hand side here, the expression x? This is a simple formula. I can remember that. So uh, here you take your, uh, instead of taking your rectangle, you take a triangle and you look for the, and you mark a special point on the right, mo on the right hand uh, edge of this uh, equilateral triangle. It's an equilateral triangle of side length one. Um, you mark a point and let x denote the distance from the vertex to that point. Then you ask yourself, what is the probability to have a connection between the bottom edge 
in this segment between your point and the top vertex along the boundary edge. And as the mesh goes to zero, uh, this probability tends to x. This, if you assume conformal invariance, which uh, Cardi was assuming, you can map the, the rectangle to a triangle, mapping the three corners of the rectangle to these three corners. The fourth corner will be mapped to this point. And then this x here is just, um, is just the image of, um, is just what this quantity is after you map it over. Well, this is a, a much nicer form of Cardi's formula. Based on this, um, Carlson proposed a program to uh, prove Cardi's formula. I'm not sure exactly when this was conceived, but I think I heard about it in around 2000, so I assume 1999. Um, and, and the goal is to prove Cardi's formula and conformal invariance of percolation. It, so you. I've said conformal invariance many times, but I didn't really tell you what this means. And um, I'd rather not be very precise about it, but basically, um, let's say informally, conformal invariance means that if you do percolation in one domain uh, and you let the mesh go to zero and you focus on some quantity or some event, uh, pro probability of some event, and if you take the conformal image of this domain in, uh, in another part of the plane, and in this other part you do percolation with critical percolation with mesh going to zero, um, and you look at the corresponding event in the other domain, then the, the two probabilities should um, converge to the same number. So here's what... Uh, Leonard Carlson proposed, he said, well, since uh, this formula is so much nicer for the triangle, it's probably worthwhile to work in the triangular lattice. Um, and um, we can uh, take a triangle in the uh, triangular lattice. Now, I should tell you, uh, well, here I drew hexagons, so I should tell you how, how this hexagon picture is related to percolation. So let's skip uh, ahead a little bit. This is site percolation on the triangular lattice. This is one of the um, models we, we've discussed already. Now, if you're drawing this picture, uh, there's a lot of wasted space here which doesn't get colored. And if you want to draw a, a big picture, uh, you don't want to waste space because uh, then the minute things will be less visible. And therefore, you, um, instead of coloring just the site itself, the round uh, circle denoting the site, you also color around it. And then you can forget about the sites altogether and be left with the hexagons. And so, if you have a... Um, you have your hexagonal lattice and you flip a coin to decide um, if you color a hexagon white or black, um, then your base, and then you look at the connected components of the black, say, then you're essentially doing site percolation on the triangular lattice, only it's nicer vi in, in a visual sense. And then, um, just like we had a, a duality in the square grid where I showed you that an n plus 1 by n rectangle has probability 1 half to be uh, crossed, the same kind of duality works for um, the uh, site percolation on the triangular grid. Here, either there's a left crossing from right to left by white hexagons or there's a, a black crossing top to bottom in uh, in black hexagons. Um, so both these models seem uh, equally um, amenable to understanding from a discrete point of view. 
Let's go back to this picture and to uh, Carlson's program. Um, so you want to know uh, if you, where, you, where you can connect the bottom, say in black hexagons, to the right-hand side. And here's a trick you can do. You can start uh, at this corner here. And you can follow this red path. The rule for this red path is whenever you meet a black hexagon or the bottom edge, you turn left. And whenever you meet a white hexagon or the left, the left edge, you turn right. And so uh, here we can imagine starting here and hitting this black hexagon. It's black, so we turn left. We came here, we hit the left edge so we turn right and so here we meet this white hexagon we turn right we turn right here the edge and so we wind uh, in this way until and we stop when we hit the rightmost edge um, and what do we see here well this red path that we have has on the right hand side it has all hexagons that are either black or the bottom edge on the left-hand side has either white hexagons or the, or the left edge. And that means that um, we, can, we, can, we, we are able to connect the tip of the, of the red uh, path on the right edge to the bottom edge by black hexagons. Um, Namely, you can just follow along the red, um, the red path, and you have this connection. But we cannot connect any further, because um, you see this, this white uh, crossing that you have just above the red uh, path is a barrier to connecting in black hexagons from the bottom. So that answers. Uh, this question, it answers the, this question of whether we can connect from bottom to uh, this segment. It doesn't answer it for a specific segment. It answers it to all segments simultaneously. Uh, namely, if the segment includes this red, uh, the, the tip of the red path, then we can connect. And if the segment doesn't include, then we can't. And the statement of, of uh, this version of Cardi's formula is the same as saying that the point where the red path hits the rightmost edge is uniform on the edge, right? For every segment, uh, well, asymptotically uniform. For every segment, the probability to hit it is proportional to the length of the segment. You can't, can't get much more uniform than that. Um, so what we want to do is to prove that uh, where we hit is asymptotically uniform. And we want to do it not only for uh, this particular triangle, but we want to do it for any conformal image of a triangle. If we take this triangle and we map it conformally, and we draw the, you know, the, the hexagonal mesh inside, we want to be able to prove the same statement in that in, in that curved triangle. Well, uh, it didn't take very long till uh, this program was carried through. Uh, Stanislav Smirnov in uh, 2001 um, was able to prove this. The, the paper is rather short, but uh, very clever. Um, and what he proved is as follows. He proved that, indeed, Cardi's formula um, and Carlson's version of it, but first uh, working with Carlson's version, it, um, is true. And the crossing probabilities are asymptotically conformally invariant as the mesh tends to 0. And in an appropriate sense, uh, the, whole con the whole percolation process is uh, asymptotically conformally invariant. I'm not being very precise here intentionally. I don't want to uh, bore you with the details of uh, 
in what topology is the convergence taking place and so forth. But don't take this to be a sign that uh, I'm unaware of, uh, of this issue or that we're careless about it. It's just uh, for the sake of uh, a talk such as this, it's better not to, uh, it's better to focus on the, on the more important. Okay, we will get back to percolation a little bit later, but um, I want to uh, now um, discuss a, a different model, which is uh, very, not very well understood. Uh, let me illustrate the definition of the model uh, with a simulation. So you start with a, this is a, there is a lattice version of this model, but uh, this simulation will do a um, disk version. You start with a single disk in the origin, and now you um, start a Brownian motion from infinity, and you uh, stop this Brownian motion when you hit the disk, or, or you hit very close to the disk, and the place where you hit it, you put a new disk. Uh, and that disk freezes now and becomes part of your cluster. And then you throw a new disk coming from the origin doing Brownian motion, and it attaches in a different place, and yet another one, and another one. And uh, these disks in the simulation are, are color-coded to indicate uh, how hot they are, namely how long has it been since they... Uh, froze, I mean, attach themselves to the cluster. And if you continue like this and throw more and more disks, uh, this thing uh, forms branches and arms uh, in interesting ways. And this is called DLA for diffusion limited aggregation. I'm not a, an expert on diffusion-limited aggregation, but if I'm not mistaken, it's, you see these arms. I think it's believed that each one of these arms uh, eventually dies and only one arm remains and then it splits and grows further arms and so on. And there are many um, interesting questions you can ask about this, but there are many, uh, there, there are very few that for which you can uh, produce some proof of. Um, one statement uh, proved by Keston is that the diameter of uh, a different version of DLA that's done on a lattice of the DLA cluster uh, grows at a rate n to the, at most n to the two thirds, at most order n to the two thirds. So after you put a uh, n of these particles, you expect the diameter to be no larger than order n to the two-thirds. Um, but this is not believed to be tight, and uh, I don't think there's even a precise guess as, as to what the um, diameter should be. And uh, let me tell you um, a little bit about um, a technique from... Um, Conform, from complex analysis, from com conformal mapping theory that um, is very useful for analyzing um, random models, especially if they have conformal invariance. Uh, the trouble with DLA, uh, which makes it harder, is that it, it's not believed to be conformally invariant in the limit. Um, actually, you can prove that it's not conformally invariant in the limit. Uh, unless it's uh, very trivial. I mean, if it, um, you can prove that if it's conformally invariant in the limit, then it's a ball in the limit. And we can see it's not a ball in the limit. Um, um, so lack of conformal invariance means that uh, it's going to be hard to analyze. Um, but you can still try. So le let me tell you a little bit about uh, Levner's theorem and um, how you can lose, use it to understand uh, 
clusters and growing shapes in the plane. Um, so we start with the Riemann mapping theorem. Suppose here you have the disk and you have, um, you excise from the disk some, some set, some compact set such that the complement is simply connected. Um, then you can map uh, the complement of this uh, excised set back conformally onto the disk by a map which we call G. And if we assume that this compact set doesn't include the origin, which we will, then you can uh, normalize G. I mean, there's not, more, there's not a single Riemann mapping. There's more than one. But there's uh, a good choice which you would take by making zero map to zero and, and then you're free to rotate, uh, um, to post-rotate the map G, but except for this freedom you have no choice. And then um, one way to normalize this rotation is by saying, okay, I'm going to also require that the derivative at the origin is going to be um, a positive real number. Um, and then there's a unique map like that. Um, now what happens if we have, uh, now this set is not, now not going to be fixed, but it's going to evolve in time. It's, it's going to grow. Say we think it's like uh, one of these DLA things or, or some other uh, object that grows in time. Then you can analyze the growth of this shape via the, the conformal maps. And here's how it works. So here, uh, on the left-hand side, you see uh, this, uh, this set, which we often call Hull for uh, inexplicable reasons. Um, so you see this Hull. And here it has a small bump on it, which is kind of a, a new part of it that has grown. And we want to understand uh, how the conformal map has changed before the adding the bump and after adding the bump. Well, you can understand this by first mapping over um, the conformal map that eliminates the thing without the bump, the original hull. And so that's this map. And then the image of this bump is now going to be uh, connected to the boundary because this whole uh, Hull here has been eliminated from the domain. The, the first map is a conformal map of the complement of the smaller Hull. And so you have the bump. Okay. And now you can think of the next map as uh, the co corresponding map which uh, gets rid of the small bump, or rather I should say the image of the small bump under the first, uh, under the first map. And so if we understand the second map, that will tell us how this first map is changing as our hull is growing. Well, it's pretty easy to understand the second map. Let's think of the inverse mapping here. F is going to be just the inverse of this mapping G. And G is the normalized uniformizing map. Um, well, if we look at the F, uh, F, we understand its boundary values. Well, its boundary values are uh, almost everywhere the absolute value of F. When, when Z is a point in the boundary, for most points, the absolute value of F of Z is 1 because the boundary here corresponds to the uh, boundary here, except for um, those, sets, those points here on the boundary which get mapped to the image of the small bump. Uh, but these, we, since the bump is small, uh, this is going to be a set of a small diameter uh, in, in this boundary here. And we can think of it as, as maybe there's some point W here, and around this point W are all the uh, points corresponding to this bump here. So if you look at log of F of Z over Z, well, it is zero for points uh, which are not, oops, for points which are not mapped to the bump, it's zero. So it's, it's 
Zero in most of the places, however, points that are mapped to the bump, those are points near W, there it's going to be negative because absolute value of Z is 1 and absolute value of F of Z is smaller than 1, so the log is going to be, uh, the log is going to be negative. So th this function F, we understand its boundary values pretty well. It's mostly 0 and in a small part it's negative near a small segment on the boundary. Okay, well does that tell us what this function is? Well essentially it does because we have the Poisson representation. I mean we know harmonic functions, we know how they behave in terms of the boundary values. Uh, if you know the boundary values, well the boundary values are here are essentially known. They're negative in a small neighborhood of W and they are zero elsewhere. If we know what the value at the origin is, that's enough to determine the, uh, the behavior of our f, um, except, except that we won't know its precise nature near w, but if we're thinking only on compact subsets of the domain, we, we can approximate f very well by uh, just knowing um, where w is and what is the value of, of this function, log of f of z over z at 0, which is the same as log of f prime of z. And that leads, uh, you know, immediately to Levener's theorem, which tells us how these maps uh, are evolving over time. Um, well, what you see here, this is the Poisson kernel, um, and the Poisson kernel just comes from the fact that we have this Poisson representation here. And the reason you have here, uh, okay, well, maybe I should first tell you uh, what this means, and then I'll tell you why the formula looks like this. So, we have our, our hull here that is growing over time, and our time parameterization for the growth of the hull is rather arbitrary at this point. We didn't choose it, so let's choose it to be convenient. And what is going to be convenient? Convenient is going to be that gt prime at zero is going to be e to the t. That's going to be our convenient parameterization of the hull, of the hull in time. And um, Okay, and WT, well, WT is this point here. For every T, there's where the hull is growing. You map it over, you have a WT. That's, uh, that's the image of the location where the hull is growing. Um, and GT is the normalized conformal map. And so I explained to you, uh, so this is the, the Poisson kernel, and I didn't explain to you why you have this GT on the right-hand side. The reason you have this GT on the right-hand side is because uh, uh, it's the log here that we're thinking of. So this is, uh, if you put the GT on this side, you're looking at the logarithmic derivative. Um, and that's all there is to it. So this is Levner's theorem. It tells us if you have a hull which is growing in time, and you parameterize it correctly, and at any time it's growing just at a single point, then the conformal maps uh, mapping the complement of the hull to the unit disk when normalized appropriately, they satisfy this differential equation. So if, if our hull uh, was just a path growing into the disk, this gives a method of um, taking a two-dimensional, a path in two dimensions, and studying it by a path in one dimension, because this WT is a, a one-dimensional path. WT stays on the boundary of the domain. Um, and dimension reduction is, uh, is a great thing to have, especially if you're going to dimension one, where Mathematics can actually be uh, done, usually. Um, so here's some, some uh, 
works using uh, this Levner equation in probability. Uh, Carlson and uh, Makarov or Makarov uh, around uh, in the 1990s, uh, they studied uh, versions of DLA with with Levner uh, with Levner's equation, and. Uh, Greg Lawler, Wendelin Werner, and I, um, in the range of years between 1999 and 2002, we studied the outer boundary of uh, two-dimensional Brownian motion. And uh, the percolation interface was uh, the, uh, the connection with Levner evolution was proved by Smirnoff. Um, and there are other, there's the Luperest random model, uh, uh, Luperest random walks, which can be better described via Levner evolution. Um, and there are many other models. Let me, uh, let's go back to percolation and see how this works. Um, if you're drawing uh, the percolation configuration in the upper half plane and you, um, Fix the hexagon so that on the boundary line, the uh, white on one half of the line and black on the other half of the line. Then you have this interface path, which is just like the interface path we, we've discussed before. And if you ask yourself, well, what shape is that path going to have? Um, you can, um, having Smirnoff's theorem, uh, at hand, you can use Cardi's formula and you can ask yourself, well, am I going to, let's draw some, some arbitrary path here, which is maybe in this figure it looks like a semicircle, but it's rather an arbitrary uh, curve and you can ask, are we going to hit this curve uh, bef before we hit the boundary of the, the big semicircle? Well, the, to answer this question, you basically need to ask uh, a, a question about percolation crossing. Because, uh, as we've seen before, the, the uh, location of the tip of the red path on the boundary translates to a question about whether you cross between a certain arc on the boundary and a certain other arc on the boundary. Um, um, I'm not going to repeat it uh, for this configuration, but you can easily see that the probability to hit uh, this arc here is given by Cardi's formula uh, for this domain. Uh, actually, the difference between two versions of Cardi's formula, one where you take this point and the other where you take that point. Uh, and so that you find that the probability to hit this curve, you can compute it explicitly and it satisfies conformal invariance uh, because Smirnoff proved that Cardi's formula holds and, and holds in a conformally invariant way. And now the next thing to realize is that if you draw a piece of this curve and you stop at a certain time, then all the hexagons on the right side of your path are all white and those on the left of your path are all black. Uh, Namely, you are in the same situation you started with, where you had the boundary divided between white and black, um, except that your domain is a little bit more complicated now. At least seems to be more complicated. See, here, you know, those hexagons that we ha didn't need to examine in order to draw this path, I didn't look at their color yet, so we can think of them as still being undetermined. Um, so why did I say that this uh, just looks more complicated than the original domain? Well, because you can apply a conformal map. Conformal maps, they simplify domains. They take simply connected domains to, to half planes, to circles, whatever you like. Um, and then when you simplify uh, by the conformal map, you get uh, your back to your original situation and you know that the distribution of the remaining part of your path has the same behavior uh, given what you've seen as the 
a priori distribution, except that this point here may have been translated from what it was, uh, from what it was here. And that, uh, so when you translate this to what does it say about the uh, Levenu parameter, this this WT, if you ask yourself what it says about WT, uh, you pretty quickly conclude that you, there are not many possibilities for what that WT can be. It has to be a uh, one-dimensional Brownian motion. Um, because Brownian motion is characterized by a few basic properties, and especially um, the fact that it forgets its past uh, and only remembers where it is now. And that is uh, illustrated in this figure. OK, so you've characterized your WT, except that there's one more parameter to choose, because you can scale the Brownian motion uh, by scaling time. Uh, and this is not, uh, this is not determined. Uh, by the argument I've, I've stated so far, you can determine what this parameter kappa has to be by checking uh, if you plug in into uh, if you plug in into this equation w t equals Brownian motion scaled at time kappa, uh, and you ask yourself, well, is Cardi's formula going to hold? There's just one 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 kappa for which it does hold, and that kappa happens to be 6. And that's how you determine uh, the parameter. And so this, this brings us to, to define uh, stochastic Levenor evolution, uh, also known as SLE, SLE kappa. It's the path uh, gamma t where you take a, uh, WT to be Brownian motion with time scaled by kappa. And um, you take, you solve uh, Levener's equation. Either if you're in the disk, you solve this l version of Levener's equation. And if you're in the half plane, you solve a slightly different version. And you define the path by taking GT inverse of WT. This is, remember, WT is supposedly the image of where the hull grows. And the pre-image is where it actually grows. And, and so uh, this is a very natural definition. Um, and um, so what we've said before is that uh, this path, its scaling limit, is, is going to be SLE6. As the mesh goes to 0, the, the limit of this path is going to be some random path. So, we have encoded the randomness in Brownian motion. And once we have the Brownian motion, we plug it in into a differential equation. Uh, the differential equation may look like an, a PDE, but it's actually an ODE in the T parameter. And so we, you know, ODEs are much easier. And we can uh, study this path from, from the uh, differential equation. So let, let me say um, some consequences. Um, with uh, Lawler and Werner, we proved uh, this conjecture of Nienhuis that the cluster of the, uh, the probability, the cluster of the origin has diameter bigger than R, actually uh, does decay like R to the minus 5 over 48 uh, with lower order corrections. And uh, Smirnov and Werner proved uh, many other percolation exponents of this form. And slightly later, uh, we showed that the outer boundary um, of the scaling limit of percolation clusters is essentially the same as that of uh, the outer boundary of planar Brownian motion. And both have Hausdorff dimension four thirds. There are some other random models uh, for which convergence to various SLEs with different parameters have been proved. Rather than um, defining all these models, since I don't have time, I will show you in pictures 
uh, what they look like. And, and you can see that SLE kappa changes quite a bit as kappa changes. So this is the Lupus random walk, uh, SLE, uh, which converges to SLE2, um, uh, which means you take your random walk as you, and you erase loops as they are created. And you get this random uh, curve, which has the same distribution as SLE2. The self-avoiding walk, which is essentially a uniform measure on all paths that are self-avoiding uh, of length n and then let n go to infinity. Its scaling limit is believed to be SLE 8 thirds, but that's still conjectured. And as far as I know, nobody has a clue how to prove it. Um, there's the critical easing model, um, which has an interface just like percolation, and it's believed to be SLE3. But here, uh, quite a few pre people have a clue how to do it. So I expect this, this will be uh, a theorem in the next uh, few years. Um, this is uh, the harmonic explorer. It converges to SLE4. Um, this is a joint work with Scott Sheffield. Um, the percolation interface, which we dis discussed, is, uh, looks like this when you do it on a fine scale, and that uh, converges to SLE6. And this is my last slide. This is uh, the uniform spanning tree piano path. This is a space-filling curve, and therefore I didn't draw all of it. I, I uh, um, terminated it at a finite time, maybe after a thousand steps or so, and it's, it's not drawn in a half plane because of simulation issues. It's faster to do it in a bounded domain, so it's drawn in a rectangle here. This is the starting point and this is the ending. I mean, it hasn't really ended, but this is when, uh, this is the last point drawn of, on the path. Um, it's, I was quite surprised that uh, a space-filling curve would, uh, you know, arise naturally as a, as a random object that you actually, rather than construct, you, you discover. Um, well, um, I've run out of time, and so I, I thank you very much for your attention.